Hi everybody, it's Dr. Lori. I'm back with Ask Dr. Lori. So, we're going to talk about your questions. I'm going to give you my expert answers. You can write the questions anywhere, here in the comments, anywhere on social media, and we will make them into a video for you. Okay, anyway, I hope you're having a good day. And I'm here, I'm going to answer, ask some questions. So let's take one out of the bowl and see what we got. Ah, I can't find my piece anywhere. I've looked everywhere online. What am I doing wrong? Eh, you're probably not doing anything wrong. <laughs> um, it is hard to find these pieces, and a lot of you, with respect to how you're looking, how you're searching, you're kind of searching willy-nilly, and you're trying to use keywords to search and to find these particular pieces. So you may not be doing anything wrong. What I have seen a lot of the time, and I see this a lot with uh, furniture, I see it a lot with lamps, I see it sometimes with clocks, is in fact hodgepodge, you know, marriages, you know, when I say when two dissimilar things come together, stick it out no matter what, your piece may be a marriage. Uh, it may be where a piece from an, an element from one piece is put together with an element from another piece. And that becomes a problem when you're trying to do research. The other thing about research is you have to have research methods and research skills. You have to know how to do that. Otherwise, you're going to be on this wild goose chase just looking at images everywhere. You could try places like looking at images when you do image searches. You can also try places like, you know, Pinterest. You can go through eBay, 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 but a lot of the stuff is incorrect. Now, and again, a lot of the times you might just get lucky. That happens too. But you want to look at the materials because a lot of people will actually have you search by materials. Sure, sure, look at the marks. The marks are the easiest thing to do. Anybody could look at a mark and say, oh, look, it's a mark. You know, the hard part is to identify what the object looks like or how the object was made. So you want to look at those types of things. How do you learn those types of things? My other videos. This is not difficult. So, but in terms of it, you may not doing anything wrong. Don't beat yourself up. It's hard to do the research. That's why, you know, a lot of people say, I'm going to have Dr. Lori help me do the research. That's basically my answer to that. So, you know, you're looking everywhere. Well, I always say, you know, you're going to stop looking once you find it. So you haven't looked everywhere yet, but I will help you. So thank you for the question. And then there's my bowl. So this episode's bowl comes from Pyrex. Pyrex, of course, is um, what sometimes people would actually call fire glass. This particular type of glass that has temperature and humidity can change and it's still okay. So Pyrex, Py like pyromania, like fire, right? So Pyrex this is a Visions bowl, and the Visions line came out, and this particular one in the late part of the 1900s, and this particular bowl has a lid that goes with it. They call it the amber um, bowl. It's kind of a brownish amber color, and value on this bowl about $30, so it's a nice piece, and I always have a different bowl on the set, excuse me, I always have a different bowl on the set every time for Ask Dr. Lori. So that's the bowl for this episode. There you go. So I'm freezing, I'm freezing in the studio today. I don't know what's up in the studio today, but today the studio is really cold. So, and I wore the wrong thing, so I'm really cold. So if I keep doing this, that's what my problem is, sorry. <laughs> All right, next question, back to the questions. Oh, upside down, right side up. I found one of those powder jars that you showed on one of your videos and I immediately bought it because I watched your video, Dr. Lori. It sold within a couple of hours of me listing it online at my shop. Great video. Oh, that's cool. I'm happy about that. Um, what else should I look for, Dr. Lori? Okay. So I always tell you, collect what's coming. Look for some of these valuable pieces. Look for what's going to come next and be the next big thing. So some people are trying to push you into certain objects that they might have in their inventory. So you want to ignore those. You you want to look for those things that relate to history, right? So you want to relate, you want to think about things like the Egyptian or the exotic movement. Like the Egyptian or the exotic movement, what are you talking about? Well, in fact, in the in the year 1922, King Tut's tomb was exhumed. And because it was exhumed, it sparked all of this interest in things Egyptian, right? So what we saw was that idea of Egyptian pieces or exotic pieces, mainly from Africa, to be of interest. We're going to see the 100-year revival of that now. In 2022, you're going to see a spike in things exotic. So you want to think about that as one of the things you should look for. The other things you should always look for, and what I'm trying to educate your eyeballs about, is I want you to look for quality. I want you to understand what quality looks like, 
and I want you to identify quality. So I want you to leave the junk at the thrift store, at the yard sale, at the flea market, at your grandma's attic, at your grandma's basement, at your mother's house, or anywhere else that you get your stuff. So I'd like you to really think about quality. It might be in the, in the form of condition. It might be in the form of how something is painted. It might be in the form of how something is glazed or formed or molded. All of these things mean something. So, you know, if you look at a piece like a piece of, I don't know, maybe a piece of Libby glass, for example, and it's got a gold rim around, a gold ring around the rim, well, you know what? If that gold is starting to scratch off, then that's a condition issue, that's a quality issue, that's a value issue. And that's what I want you to think about. So look for those types of things. Always look for quality. If it feel if in your gut you say to yourself, you know what, Dr. Lori? I really think I might like this piece. There's something about it, but I can't put my finger on it. As long as it's low enough, hey, buy it. See what happens. If you're trying to sell pieces, I want you to be aware that that's what the buyers are looking for too. They're looking for quality. I'm going to show you what it looks like. All right, next question. Let's see, what else have we got? Hi, Dr. Lori. When I watch your videos, I'm always amazed at how fast you can tell the difference between a diamond and a rhinestone. Well, let me tell you, I've liked jewelry a long time. I can tell the difference between a diamond and a rhinestone. And the other thing about me is why I'm so fast at all of this stuff. Very impatient personality. I like everything to be done quickly. I can't stand waiting. I'm not good in a line. You don't want to wait in line with me. I'm like out of my mind. I can't stand it. But so when you're thinking about quick, I want you to be able to be that quick. Like I want you to be able to do what I do because I want you to be able to do it because once you learn it, it's yours. Nobody can take it away from you. So the question is, um, I'm amazed at how fast you can tell the difference between a diamond and a rhinestone, which isn't really that difficult to do. Any helpful tips on how I can tell the difference? Well, there are a lot of different colorless stones, right? So there are spinels and there are cubic zirconias and there are diamonds and there are rhinestones. They're all different types. And basically, in terms of all different types, um, I want you to be able to tell a diamond. The easiest way, and you have seen this in the movies. You've probably seen this in the 1950s movies, you know, where they look back, they go, <sighs> and then they look at their diamonds, <sighs> and then they look at their diamonds. What they're trying to do is they're trying to see if the diamond will fog up. And this is a trick that a lot of people would use over and over again. And I can see all those old actresses, you know, way back think, doing this. That idea basically means that if you put your hot air on a diamond, right, um, if it, it will not fog. So diamonds won't fog up. Other stones will fog up. So basically, you're looking for, of course, if it doesn't fog up, basically, you know that it's clear, the clarity of a diamond. It's one of those old fashioned things that usually does work. The best way to really tell, I think the best way to tell would be a diamond tester, right? You get the diamond tester machine and you test the diamonds. That's what most jewelers will use or a GIA certified jeweler with an on-site lab. But the diamond testers are relatively inexpensive. And of course, you know, at drlaurieV.com, you can also see some suggestions of some things that might be good tools for you to have in your tool chest when you're out shopping or when you're trying to buy or sell. And the other thing about diamonds is you want to look for a lot of sparkle and a lot of fire. Rhinestones don't always look that way. While rhinestones can have some sparkle, you basically are usually looking at baguettes, which are usually cut a different way. The way a piece is cut is also going to be very important. So take that into account. Why am I fast? Been doing this for a long, long time. <laughs> okay, let's see. This is a skinny one. Is a stone lithograph a random dot pattern and a plate lithograph a consistent dot pattern? No. No. So what you're asking is about lithography or prints. Lithography and the idea of lithographs actually is that idea of carving into a stone and then greasing the stone and inking the stone. That's the terminology for lithography, right? Lithographs. A plate lithograph is something that evolved as, of course, we got away from digging into those flat stones, right, and, in, and greasing them and inking them. We got into, of course, what was called plate lithography, where an actual plate would be utilized instead. So different material, you have a different result. When you talk about the dot pattern, you've heard me talk about the dots. You know, if you look at a poster and you get your loop out, right, you get your loop and you say, okay, I'm going to look. I'm going to look and I'm going to look for a dot pattern. A dot pattern usually tells you of a mechanical, 
right? A mechanical produced print. So that's why you're looking for the dots. That's the idea. So good question. Thanks for it. But no, it's not consistent and random. What you can see sometimes is you will see, of course, a dot pattern, but whether it's random or not, you might have a different type of print. So watch the videos about prints because I tell you how to do that. There's lots of videos here about the prints. Watch those and they'll help you to identify it. Next question. Good question though. Next question. I bought three vintage chairs, Dr. Lori. Well, two really, and the other one is just in parts. Okay. What if a buyer wants the two chairs that are assembled, that are not just parts? Should I just throw in the other chair that's missing the part, unassembled, like give it to them as a gift? No, because you devalue the other chairs that are assembled if you do that. It's as if to say, oh, well, that's just parts and it's not really important. It is important. That third chair, I wouldn't give that up just as, oh, I'm just throwing it in. You want to give a gift to a, a buyer. Oh, okay, fine. That's fine. Do it. Have it be something other than what you they actually purchased if you feel the need to give a gift. I don't know. I think I thought you were trying to run a business. I don't know. Maybe you are. I don't know. I wouldn't be giving gifts personally. Now, what I, I give out a lot of gifts. Actually, I spent, I spent the last, you know, week trying to find places where I could donate the baby blanket gifts that I wanted to give. And it was not that easy, I have to tell you. It was, I called hospitals, and I called the folks at the homeless shelters, and I called uh, some adult daycare places, and I called all different kinds of places to uh, the Linus Project. I called all kinds of people to try to see how I could do this. And many of them were very, very helpful, but it wasn't that easy to identify fire companies. Somebody said maybe they'll take them. So anyway, but I did find my, I, 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 I think I did find where I'm going to be able to donate these because I've been doing a lot of crocheting because I'm hanging around. Anyway, but your chairs, if you're giving a gift, no. The ones that are intact that you that you sold, great, you sold them. The other one, you might want to put it together, you might want to have it restored, and you might want to resell it. So I don't want you to be just willy-nilly saying, oh, I'm going to do that, because you're going to devalue the pieces that you already sold. Someone's going to say, well, if she can get rid of these, or he can get rid of these, and just give me the pieces of the other one, how important are the two that I just bought? So be careful with that. I wouldn't do that. You don't want to devalue the other pieces. Okay, what else is there? Uh, I read that shining a black light on crystal will give it a purple hue, while regular clear glass will give a green hue. Is that true? Well, in fact, it is true that if you shine a black light on crystal, it could give a purple or bluish color you. So uh, you'll see people, they'll go into the thrift stores and they'll be walking around, they'll have the black light and they'll be shining it everywhere. Well, that does happen, people do that. I think there are better ways to tell, but people like black lights. I was never big on black lights. When I was in museums, there was always one curator who had the black light out. She was constantly going around to all the paintings, looking at the black light to see, looking with the black light to see where a painting had been in-painted or over-painted or repaired. It's a good tool. It's not like it's a bad thing. When it comes to crystal, however, there are better ways to tell um, because you can have different levels or different percentages of what you're looking for, which black light is basically trying to show you in that particular case, that purple or bluish hue. The percentage uh, in crystal is 24% lead. Right. So if you have 24% lead, then you have, of course, crystal. And that's the definition for it, just having a percentage of lead. Now, the better the percentage of lead or the higher the percentage of lead in your crystal, the better your piece of crystal. So some crystal is 32% or more. And that indicates more better quality, typically. Here's what you look for. You look for clarity in a piece of crystal and you look for weight. It's easier to identify it by weight, picking them up. And why that will help you instead of just putting the black light on it, it will teach you how crystal should feel. And I want you to do these things because while these things sound like, oh, uh, I have to touch every single piece, yes, you have to touch every single piece. And the reason why I want you to do that is once you touch it and you get a feeling for how it should feel, you're not going to need all these tools and all these tricks and all these little tips. You're going to basically be able to do it yourself. That's empowering you. That's how you make somebody succeed. That's how you teach people. That's what I want to do. Not just pick it up and show it to you. I want you to touch it and feel it. And so in your brain and through your hands, you say, uh, I know that's crystal. Yeah, yeah, I got the black light to confirm it maybe, but I know it. And that's what I want you to do. That's how you're going to succeed. Okay, because I'm on your team, you know. <laughs> 
And then there's this one. Hi, Dr. Lori, when do we use a 10 times loop versus a 30 times loop? Well, a 30 times loop would be uh, if you have to see something that's more detailed. So a 10 times loop would be used for magnification if it's not too detailed. The 30 times loop would be if, of course, it is detailed. So that's basically the difference. You know, the higher X, 30X, basically 30 times, it's going to magnify it a lot more. So that's the simple answer to that. I love your questions. Keep them coming. I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks so much for all of your submissions, and I appreciate it. We'll see you next time.